Hi, everybody. Maud here. Um, it's great to see you, or at least uh, I hope you can see me. I can't really see you, obviously. Um, but I, I am here to share a few thoughts about the semester thus far and the semester that will be, I hope, uh, going forward, um, and to give you some updates on my thinking about the college over the next uh, stretch of time. Um, but before I do any of that, I really want to thank everybody uh, who's watching this. Um, for everything that you have uh, done over the last few weeks and months to help get us where we are. This has been a really challenging period for the college. Um, I've said to many people, uh, this has been some of the most challenging moments of my professional life, um, but it has been made much easier and better because I'm working in an environment with so many wonderful people who have been doing so much to help uh, get us where we are and also who are exhibiting such patience uh, and generosity of spirit uh, throughout all of this um, global pandemic. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful and wanted to start with that. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, sort of in three parts here, a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present, and a little bit about the future. Um, and my emphasis is going to be on the future. But uh, before we get there, just I think a little bit about how we've gotten where we are. Uh, and as you all know, uh, we made the unprecedented decision in the middle of March to transition the college to remote learning. Um, and that decision was uh, an exceptionally challenging one in the face of, um, at the time, a great deal of uncertainty about what the right decision should be. Uh, in addition to the fact that um, there was a, I would say, most people at the time uh, really didn't want that to be the end result. And so um, I spent quite a bit of time doing research, and this will, um, I think, speak to sort of the future thinking as well, uh, about what the science was telling us um, and what higher education, medical schools, schools of public health uh, were saying would be the best decision for um, institutions of higher education and others uh, in that moment. And that led us to that very difficult, but I think now um, uh, certainly a correct decision to transition to remote learning. Uh, and once we did that, of course, uh, we had a couple of weeks of vacation and we move into what I would call the present. Um, and in the present, uh, what has been guiding the college is a set of principles around all decision making, whether it was the decision for our students to go to universal pass fail, the decision to postpone commencement uh, celebrations, the decision to uh, shut down some of our summer programming, each one of these um, has been guided by a set of essentially three principles that I wanted to outline. Uh, the first has been um, really to try and balance, uh, on the one hand, people's quite justified anxiety and desire to understand and know what their immediate future holds, uh, with against a, a, um, a pressure to make a decision too quickly so that it shuts off doors and options that we might have too precipitously. And so one of the things I've really been trying to do is to walk a path between making decisions efficiently and effectively while simultaneously waiting as long as possible so that all possible doors are open to us. And that means that sometimes you might be looking for the answer to a question that we don't have the answer for yet, not because we're holding back information, but just simply because it doesn't make any sense to decide something for the sake of deciding it if waiting two or three weeks will give us a little more information that will allow us to make a better decision. Um, and so that's been the first principle, walking the line between deciding things quickly and deciding uh, making best decisions with good evidence. A second principle has been around communication. Um, and I, I hope this has been evident to you if you've been reading the many uh, emails that have come from me, but also from many members of senior staff, um, HR, uh, the provost. Um, and what we're trying to do is write out quite a bit, not only about um, what we've decided, but how we're deciding and when we're deciding so that we can try to answer questions in real time. Um, and I would say the upside to that form of communication and the reason why we've done it um, is so that we can begin to answer questions as quickly as possible. The downside certainly means that sometimes we're answering questions before we have answers. And it leads us to say things like, uh, for example, we're opening or launching a committee uh, without necessarily knowing precisely what the charge is or who the makeup of the committee will be so that we can let you know how we're thinking. And I, and I think of this as a framing the how and the when in order to get us to the what. 
Um, and so you'll undoubtedly have noticed a larger number of communications with that goal of transparency uh, embedded in it, but it does mean that um, at times I'm really asking for your patience uh, as we work our way to the best possible um, outcomes. And then the third um, principle has really been around compassion and empathy and trying to um, take into account uh, the impact of the sets of events that we've all been facing uh, and the ways it shapes many of us in different ways. Uh, we're, not, we're not all experiencing this evenly. So how can we help meet most people where they are uh, through the policies and decisions that we, that we enact? Um, and it's really these three guiding principles that have determined the, the, where we are now, um, but will also, I think, help us determine what we are going to do going forward. And that brings me to the all-important question of the future uh, and what um, Williams plans to do over the next couple of months. And here is a really good example of how the other three principles that I just outlined are at work, um, precisely because I can't actually answer for you yet what is Williams going to do uh, after July. Um, and the reason for that, if you think back to that first principle, is I'm trying to gather as much information as I possibly can uh, so that I can make the best decision with the senior faculty, senior staff, members of the board of trustees, uh, and other um, key constituents as we, as we try to gather that information and make good decisions. So, so rather than telling you what we're going to decide, um, what I can remind you of is, is the, the how and the when. Um, and the, the how has been largely focused on what I've been calling um, informally the, a two-branch tree. So we have two working groups that, have, uh, that I have established. The first is working under um, the presumption that the college will open in the fall as planned. Maybe exactly when it was supposed to open or, or shortly thereafter with some delay, uh, but with the goal of setting up all of the um, safety precautions that we would need to make in order for the college to open successfully. And that group is really dealing with, I would say, three levels of question. The first is, uh, how can we protect um, any population of students who come to campus, people who are, who are joining our campus and who make up our community? A second issue is how can we uh, protect everybody else? So the people who work uh, here and live in and around us, what are the what kinds of protocols and policies and practices would we have to put in place for that? And thirdly, what would we do for people who couldn't return um, for any re number of reasons, uh, either because uh, they opt out for various reasons or because there are medical reasons that prevent them from returning or other reasons. Uh, so that working group is really focused on what it would take to open and when we could feasibly do it in a world in which there is not yet a vaccine uh, for COVID-19. Uh, we then have a second working group that is thinking very carefully about various scenario plannings around remote learning. Uh, and this one too is thinking about all kinds of interesting and creative approaches to our curriculum and to supporting students academically uh, at, if we can't open on time. Um, and these two working groups are functioning separately, but as I'm sure you understand as you listen to this, there is overlap. So for example, if the working group that is working towards opening comes to the conclusion it, it will not be safe to open or we can't set up a good environment for opening prior to January, and I'm, I'm really arbitrarily picking that date for the purposes of the example of this presentation, then the other group would have to have come to some kind of um, plan for how to do academic offerings up until that point. But even after that point, there would be students who would be unable to return, who would have to study remotely, the, uh, uh, and et cetera. So you can see, I think, the ways in which these two working groups could very likely um, overlap and connect with each other. Uh, and so it is, um, it is the plan for these groups to gather as much information as possible, work out uh, in, in as great detail as possible the scenarios in front of them. Um, and now I get to the crucial question of when. Um, and we've decided that um, no later than July 1st, we'll decide which of these scenarios or which combination of these scenarios uh, Williams will be adopting uh, for the next academic year. Um, and the reason we picked July 1st is we felt we needed a date that was as far out as possible so that we could have as much information as possible. Think about that first principle. 
However, uh, that still allows particularly people who don't live anywhere near uh, Williamstown to make plans to get here if that's the plan or to come up with other alternative plans if for whatever reason uh, the decision we make uh, doesn't suit their needs in a particular uh, in the particular frame or way that we have done it. Um, so this, I hope, provides enough flexibility for people to to make those kinds of decisions and choices. Uh, what it means for you, you whoever, if you're listening to this, you represent all corners of this institution. Um, you do many, many different kinds of work uh, for the institution, um, and and so what I'm about to say will only make sense for some of you. Uh, but what I've been saying for many is we really have to all plan for both scenarios as much as possible. We have to both make certain kinds of plans uh, as if we are going to open, and we have to make other kinds of plans uh, on if the scenario uh, comes to pass that we have to delay opening. Um, and uh, we both we have to take both of those um, as far forward as we can, um, which I understand may not be very far until that July 1st deadline uh, and when we make a final decision and then can, and then can um, build out whatever programs or other things we need to do to get us there. Uh, and I should note that if we can make the decision before July 1st, if we have the information we need, we certainly will do so. That is that is our outside deadline, uh, but I think it's a realistic one in terms of what we're hearing from the state, um, uh, from the governor, from the federal government, uh, and from our various um, health uh, and uh, public health and medical advisors with whom we're speaking. So last thing I'll say before ending is, since people often ask, I am talking uh, a great deal to you. Um, folks at other schools, other presidents from lots of different kinds of schools, uh, to various public health officials, to, as I say, to doctors, to um, the governor of, of Massachusetts and others. Uh, so we make this decision not alone, um, but in conversation, deep conversation with our peers, which is not to say we'll do exactly what our peers do. I think each institution is looking in that broader landscape and then doing what makes sense uh, for that institution. So now let me just end where I began by thanking you all for your, your attention to this uh, video, um, for your support for Williams College in this really difficult moment. I really wanna wish you and your families a good health and safety uh, as we go through this period. And once again, thank you for your patience uh, and, and big hearts as we, as we navigate this together. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, uh, Duke's Love, Provost and Professor of Economics. I hope that you and yours are as safe uh, and healthy as possible in the current environment. I'm here to talk to you today about the financial crisis and the college's response, both in the upcoming year uh, and in the years following. So as a starting point, uh, we need to recognize that this is not just a single crisis. This is actually two crises. We have a health crisis and we have a financial crisis. The health crisis was really what justified all of our initial steps that you've been reading about over the past several weeks of getting students off campus, getting all of us off campus. And there, we really weren't paying attention to the financial implications. Uh, our immediate concern, as it remains, is the health and safety of all of our students, faculty, uh, staff. Of course, relatively quickly, we realized that this crisis was going to have major economic implications. Uh, those economic implications showed up in changing asset markets, uh, so in the, uh, in the stock market, in the college's endowment, showed up, of course, in very high rates of jobless claims uh, that you've been reading about in the news, and it's showing up in enormous amounts of uncertainty. So in responding to that crisis, uh, actually the twin crises, I wanna keep a few basic principles in mind. And these principles have really governed the college's response to date and they will continue to govern uh, the college's response. So the first principle that we need to keep in mind is that our priority is going to remain supporting the college's mission and people. Uh, we're gonna support the academic mission. We're gonna support all of our students, our faculty and staff. That's fundamentally what we're here to do. So no matter what we do in responding to the financial crisis, this is going to be a very compressed version of strategic planning where it forces us to really articulate our most important priorities. The second principle that we wanna keep in mind is that this crisis feels different from what many of you uh, lived through in 2008 and 2009, in that there's a huge amount of uncertainty. There's uncertainty, of course, about financial markets, that's one piece. 
But there's also a lot of uncertainty about very basic pieces that we once took for granted. How are we going to be open in the fall? What does next academic year look like? Uh, when are we actually going to get back into the offices and out of our homes? So that uncertainty is going to cause us to do some slightly different things in response to the current crisis. And the third basic principle is just to recognize that some of the changes that we're responding to are going to be long lasting changes and we're going to need to respond in a commensurate way. Other changes are much more temporary in nature. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So a long lasting change would be to the value of the endowment. Uh, when the endowment declines, I wish we had a perfect crystal ball and we could predict the actual direction of financial markets, but we can't. So when the endowment has fallen, we really do need to take steps to reduce spending um, uh, almost dollar for dollar with the equivalent version of the endowment. Whereas if we face even a relatively challenging fall and spring from a revenue perspective, that's relatively temporary. We don't think that's going to be the state of the world much beyond uh, the current year. And that means that it's going to be much easier for us to actually accommodate that kind of shock. So let me just actually talk about what those shocks are, what we're doing in response, um, and then what we're planning to do in the future. At the end of March, our endowment had fallen not as dramatically uh, as in 2008 and 2009, but it was between 15 and 20 percentage points below what our expectation for the endowment was. That is, we expected the endowment to return about 7%, and it was substantially below that fiscal year to date. Now, what that means for us is because our endowment finances fully half of our spending each year, that decline in the endowment is going to cause us to need to contract total spending to the tune of about $25 million a year in the steady state. And that's on a base of a $250 million budget. So that's one of the changes that we're responding to. The other change is to the revenue sources to the college. Uh, our revenues really come from three basic sources. We get revenue from net tuition revenue from our parents, from the endowment that we just talked about. 50% of our revenue is coming from a draw on the endowment each year. And the remaining revenue comes from a combination of current gifts and uh, from some of our uh, rental properties and other uh, non-tuition, non-gift revenue. So what that means is that those two other major pieces of revenue uh, net tuition revenue and gift revenue, both of those are going to be affected by this crisis. The gift revenue is likely to be affected because just as we're all um, affected by the crisis, so too are the generous families who support the college. And for the exact same reason, we expect to see a decline in our net tuition revenue as we see increased need coming from our aided students and their families and having an increasing proportion of students on financial aid. So those are the relatively predictable effects of the current crisis. And then I'd like to add to that the great unknown. And the great unknown is, uh, and Maud's talked about this um, in the past, is what are we gonna be doing next year? Uh, are we gonna be on campus? Will we have a part of the uh, semester off campus? And what will that do to total net tuition revenue? What will that do to other costs? So altogether, what we have is a combination of known reductions in resources, and a huge increase in uncertainty. And that those basic principles will end up guiding almost all of the college's decisions. So the uncertainty means that we have a strong incentive to push as much of our spending into the future as we can. And we wanna push spending into the future, especially in the cases of anything that feels like a hard to reverse commitment. Now, if you think about what the college spends on, a lot of what we spend on falls into the category of a largely irreversible commitment. When we hire faculty and staff, we're doing so for the long term. When we build buildings, we're building them knowing that we can't sell them in the end. I love our buildings, but nobody's actually willing to buy, for the most part, any of our academic buildings, our science center, our libraries, our other facilities. So the very first step that we took in responding to the crisis was to push off as many of those decisions as possible. So immediately halted uh, construction. That was partly a response to COVID, but also a recognition that we needed to stop capital projects. We sharply pulled back 
on the annual expenditure on capital. So that's the equivalent of fixing your boiler uh, in your basement. And we also agreed that we would actually slow down the rate of hiring. So because we make such a long-term commitment to our faculty and to our staff, we also wanted to slow the pace of hiring. So in thinking through these decisions, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we benefited from both the community's input and also had broadly representative experts uh, and voices helping us guide, helping the college guide its way through these decisions. So we created, as many of you know, an ad hoc group on financial planning. I won't go through the full list of members, but it's been an unbelievable group. And we have over the past several weeks been working our way through these very difficult uh, problems. That is first, what are we gonna do as far as staffing uh, and salaries for the upcoming year? Second, how are we gonna think about non-people spending at the college? So the operating budgets, not including salary. And third, how are we gonna think about capital spending? As the group uh, has deliberated, we've come around to some basic principles for preparing for this upcoming year. First and most importantly, we've decided absolutely that to the extent that we can as a college, we would like to hold off as much as possible on any policies that actually affect all of you, uh, faculty and staff, um, and to, to the extent that we can really protect jobs. Um, we've said that from the very beginning, and we feel that that's an important principle. And the good news is that we've identified already a series of steps that we can take that will accommodate even severe financial shocks in this current year, and to do so while holding on to uh, our employees. And that was an important principle governing our work. Secondly, we decided that in order to do that, we did need to find substantial savings. And so we're going to recommend to senior staff and to the college that for this year, we hold uh, pay growth flat. Uh, that this would be a no raise year for faculty and for staff with some very targeted exceptions in some special cases of restructurings on the staff side and on the faculty side one very small issue involving incoming uh, new faculty that was on the uh, salary side on the position side we're arguing for a freeze in all new hiring with again because we're williams college some exceptions now, those exceptions recognize that in some key areas, we do need to hire um, and that that hiring is going to support the core mission of the college and indeed might allow us to support some of the most critical needs that are in fact arising because of, of COVID-19. And then on the capital side, we're going to recommend, of course, holding off on capital projects, waiting until we've learned more about the state of uncertainty before deciding on those capital projects. And then one of the sweeping reforms involved what we call manager's budgets. So this is the non-people spending across all of the academic and non-academic departments across the college. Here, we created one of the uh, most challenging tasks for managers across the college, which is we compressed what looked like a half year budget process into a period of about a week and a half. And we asked all of those managers to develop scenarios for five, 10 and 15% reductions below fiscal 20s budget. They did that in remarkably uh, subtle ways uh, and in a very nuanced approach, identified some changes that would preserve the core mission of the college and gave us a sense of just how painful it would be to achieve those different levels of cuts. And based on all of that information that we received, we decided that the sweet spot seemed to be a 10% cut across all of the senior staff areas of the college. So for example, the provost area, the dean of the faculty, communications, et cetera. And that that would allow us a little bit of time. We understand that we may be in a similar position next year if conditions deteriorate, but this was the right first step for now. We're going to be recommending that suite of proposals to senior staff uh, in the next week and senior staff will come to its own decision, but it's likely, uh, since I'm actually in both of those roles, both on senior staff and also on the ad hoc committee, and it's likely uh, that that uh, suite of policies will be adopted for this coming year. And again, the most important piece is that within that set of policies, 
we have protected uh, staff jobs and faculty jobs uh, for the coming year, and that that remains one of the, the core principles. Our next big task as a committee in a college is to recognize two things. One is that next year, because we can't predict exactly what it's going to look like, is going to require a lot of very fast contingency planning. So what will we do academically? What will we do financially to prepare for a fall and a spring? The one thing we can say is that it's likely to be quite different from what we have ordinarily been doing. So that's one immediate task. The other task is to recognize that we do face additional sources of financial uncertainty. So right now, as many of you know, financial markets have not taken as steep a decline as they saw in, in 2008, 2009. If markets decline uh, again in a substantial way, we have to be prepared to respond next year. So part of what we're going to be doing as an ad hoc committee is developing proposals that allow us to prepare for exactly that possible future. So that's what we're doing. I will um, take the time to actually thank many of you for reaching out to us through the ad hoc committee's portal and sharing uh, some excellent ideas that we've been considering as a group. And one of the most important early ideas that we really listened to was a loud and clear uh, uh, set of responses, getting at some of the anxiety about uh, jobs and positions and the commitment of the college to supporting all of us through a really difficult time. And I just want to end by recognizing I know how hard this is uh, for so many of you. Uh, it has left almost all of our families touched in some important way. And I just want to, again, thank all of you for being flexible for all that you're doing to support the college and the mission of the college uh, in the months and in the years to come. Thank you.